Welcome to Deep Space Dive, a DS9 podcast brought to you by Graphic Policy Radio. DS9 is the Star Trek with the greatest focus on political concepts like colonialism, feminism, queerness, and post-scarcity economics. Join hosts and guests who aren't just Trekkies, but activists, academics, artists, therapists, union organizers, and more, as we do a deep dive into the text and subtext where few Star Trek podcasts have gone before. Speaking of where Star Trek podcasts have gone before, this is not a recap podcast. There are many fine podcasts that do that. Instead, we are focusing on characters, themes, and alien species with a different topic each week and often a special guest. The other thing to keep in mind is because we are going theme by theme, this entire podcast is a here there be spoilers experience. If you have not completed watching the whole show, we suggest that you finish watching the show but, and then go through our archive and catch up when you're done. Or you could just be one of those weirdos who doesn't really care about spoilers. That's the other legit option. Sometimes I'm one of those weirdos. I'm co-host Ilana Levin, also host of Graphic Policy Radio. Um, I have worked at the intersection of comics, nerd culture, and social change for over a decade. And my biggest Star Trek cred is I gave a speech on fan activism at a rally organized by Lita, a.k.a. Chase Masterson of Deep Space Nine. I'm Sarah Daniel Rasher, and when I'm not getting paid to use math to save the world, I write about film and figure skating. My Star Trek claims to fame are that I was the founding captain of my high school Star Trek club, and I once got Nicole DeBoer to kiss me at a convention. Ooh, I'm jealous. Now, it's on the cheek. While we don't, well, I mean, without saying, while we don't normally do episodes of this podcast about particular episodes of DS9, the episode we're about to do is such a perfect encapsulation of a particular theme that's close to our hearts that we actually are going to do it for this one. And that is season four, episode 15, Bar Association, also known as the time of the folks at Quark's Bar organized a labor union. Uh, it really is the perfect chance to talk about DS9 through the lens of worker rights and labor unions, which is you know, connects to my own background as a former labor organizer and communications person. Uh, and in fact, wanting to get my friend, our today's guest, Asher Huey, on the podcast to talk about this topic was one of the first ideas I had for the show. So allow me to introduce Asher Huey, who is a DC-based progressive activist and organizer. He is the digital director at the American Federation of Teachers. Star Trek.com profiled his activism and love of Star Trek in 2019. Welcome to the show, Asher. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I, um, we were one of the folks where when we met and I found out you were into DS9, I was, well, of course you are. Of course you're into DS9. <laughs> that's the, that, that's the one that like labor nerds who like science fiction are into. It goes without saying. I love Deep Space Nine. It is my favorite of all of the Star Treks. And I have seen every um, moment of Star Trek. <laughs> that they have produced. Um, wow. But uh, Deep Space Nine is definitely, definitely my favorite. And you feel like the, inf that the, sh that your Star Trek fandom has, you know, influenced your own uh, decision to be, you know, active in social movements and do labor organizing work. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, in the Star Trek.com piece that you mentioned, uh, I, I talked about this. Um, you know, I, I think about like what, drove me to um, to do social good and when I look back it was definitely Star Trek Star Trek sort of laid the groundwork I loved it as a kid um, in elementary school I would I wouldn't miss an episode of the next generation Deep Space Nine premiered while I was in elementary school and um, when I look back I, I you know I, I looked at this this uh, utopian future uh, post-scarcity society where we've overcome racism and sexism and and our uh, scientists exploring the the universe and it was great so one of the things that I'm excited about is like that this this episode of Deep Space Nine is like actually really unique in popular culture um, I find that 
uh, whenever somebody asks online, like, hey, what are some, which in labor Twitter happens a lot, hey, what are some shows or movies that have labor union th- like s- stories in them? But I'm no, not Norma Ray and not like <laughs> movies that are specifically about labor unions for like, frankly, like, you know, Salt of the Earth, which is like for a labor union audience. Like, this is the episode that everybody basically brings up. Yeah, I mean, I so I, I love all those shows and movies. Um, uh, as a kid, you know, Meituan was one of my favorite movies, which probably was also an indication of the direction I was going. But uh, this <laughs> this uh, this episode is is particularly um, important in that regard because it it shows. Um, I think it, within within the confines of this episode, it obviously when you're actually organizing a union, it, it takes a little longer, but uh, it really shows you know the um, the way that the workers can uh, leverage their stick together and leverage their power, form the union, uh, go on strike, and um, and uh, you know create a better workplace for themselves by sticking together through their solidarity. And there's multiple moments throughout the union where they do that, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, And uh, one of the things, you know, Star Trek is this utopian future, but this is also the only um, specific episode of Star Trek about labor unions. There are unions that are mentioned and there are plenty of other episodes that deal with the economics of the future that deal with workers. Um, I can go through uh, the original series. You have the cloud minders um, in the next generation. Um, uh, the episode, the neutral zone, Picard talks about how humanity's moved beyond needing to possess so much. And uh, you've got the next generation line where Picard explicitly says um, uh, wealth isn't our driving force. Um, Voyager has an episode called workforce. Deep space nine actually has past tense. Uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, the episode where they um, accidentally go back in time and and uh, are put in like a homeless camp. Uh, Cisco's put in a homeless camp. These are all great episodes that deal with economics, but this is the one that's specifically about um, labor unions and workers and organizing, which makes it pretty unique even within the Star Trek universe. It mattered so much to me that Rom... Well, I mean, first it's Bashir, but like Bashir literally says, like, you need a union. It isn't just like, maybe you guys should organize or something. It's like, no, no, a labor union um, as a specific concept. Uh, Yeah, it's great. And you sort of, you see this moment of Rom when it happens, like, oh, oh, that's a, that's a thought that hadn't occurred to me. And it's both scary and exciting. And, and it's, it's a it's a great moment because the union, as we see, is uh, the thing, the, the organization of the workers that gets them their power, that makes things better in the end. I liked how this show sort of connects Rom learning about forming a union with some human labor history. At, uh, yes, it does. Uh, O'Brien, um, Actually, throughout the episode, I think throughout the series, he says, oh, you know, my ancestor did this. Uh, he does that twice in this episode. First, mm-hmm. it was his ancestor, right. uh, was the, the warrior. Um, and then uh, his ancestor led the uh, the 1902 coal miner strike in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, it was uh, that that part makes me laugh. I think it's cool because, like, you have Bashir, who's sort of speaking, who sort of speaks about the value of a union kind of like in an intellectual way that's very driven by problem solving. Mm-hmm. And then you have, and you have, then you have um, O'Brien who talks about a union as part of like his history and like culture, which are like bo- both kind of like very, di- and of course like O'Brien because he's one Irish and two O'Brien, yeah. the hero <laughs> dies at the end of the story because of course it's tragic. It's O'Brien. Um, but it, it was interesting to me, like as those are two very different ways of connecting with the labor story. Yeah. So I, I this, this, there's two things that I want to say in, resp- in response to that. First, um, uh, O'Brien and, um, uh, you know, the, his, his ancestor died for the strike. I think it's important, especially for anybody who's listening who doesn't understand labor history, is that it wasn't that long ago that uh, labor organizers, workers who were forming a union were killed for doing it. Um, and uh, they then tie that into the episode, I think, pretty nicely when... Um, the FCA shows up and really does threaten to to put someone out in airlock. Um, but 
the thing that I was thinking about when I was rewatching the episode to to do this was was I I hadn't actually put it in my mind the way that you said it. O'Brien is the you know very passionate one. This is our history. This is what we do. Um, and and uh, Bashir was the intellectual one about how to solve problems. But you actually see that very clearly in the conversation where Bashir is like, well, you know, the strike is the last resort, which is true. A strike should be the last resort um, because you have to uh, do a lot of work to get yourself there in practice. Um, and he talks through Bashir very much talks through with this is what you want. This is how you would negotiate it. This is, you know. And and O'Brien really is just like yes, let's you know let's do this. It's it's um, I, I thought that that was particularly great and instructive when I was watching it, um, and and having you know watched it as a kid, rewatched it as an adult after a, a breakup. It, you know, it was a great thing to spend a couple of years doing after a breakup instead of dating, just rewatching Deep Space Nine, um, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, and then. Um, uh, rewatching it now, sort of with that focus, I was like, actually, uh, Doctor Bashir is like making good, like strategic points about how to do this. Yeah, which is like his brand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I never thought about this till now. Like Nausikins, the guys throwing the big, gross aliens throwing darts at each other. Like those are Pinkertons. Those I are literally Pinkertons. <laughs> was just thinking that they are Pinkertons. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, kids, in real life, Pinkertons are exactly as gross as Nausicaans. Yes. So don't support that. Oh, God. And in 2020, um, they came back. Yeah. Pinkertons were back um, in the news. Well, I want to focus again on our hero in this, which is Rom. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when I, I think in some ways people might think of Rom as being an unconventional union organizer, but, and actually in a lot of ways, he's perfectly situated for this. Do, do you want to talk about some of your thoughts on why Rom is good for this role? Oh, well, you know, I hadn't, um, these are just off the cuff cause I didn't, uh, sort of think this part through, but, um, I think there are a lot of reasons why one, he is an exploited worker. Um, mm -hmm. he's the actual worker. He's not coming at it from an outside intellectual perspective. He's a person who's experiencing it with everyone else. Is a person who's respected by everyone else in the bar, mm -hmm. um, and um, he's also a person whose labor Quark really needs. Quark's success is built entirely on the work that everyone in his bar does, especially Rom, who fixes things with like Jerry rigs all of the stuff to make sure that it works. Who's who works harder than anyone else, probably including Quark. All of the success is built on that. So for Rom to stand up and say, hey, this is wrong, especially because he's his brother, but uh, to say this is wrong uh, really, um, I think, sort of sets a tone for the rest of the workers. And in that moment, we saw some very real leadership from Rom. He's yeah. able to get even other Ferengi to, to form and to join a labor union. Well, one of the things that he's that that I noticed with him too is that he's a good listener. Like in the first place, where he's trying to tell other people about why you know they should join, what this means to them, he's citing their own personal reasons and like for what they're suffering from. Like you have a back that freezes up, mm -hmm. and you have this and that. Like Ram is a good listener, and being able to listen to people's immediate concerns. And connect those concerns to why a union is the solution to those concerns is like step one of having one-on-one -on -one meetings with workers in an organizing campaign. Absolutely. Yeah. And similar to that, um, he's also a cultural mediator because one of I although the human characters sort of spark the idea in him to have, and one of the great things about Deep Space Nine is that the humans are very frequently aliens, and in this case, that's really true that they're bringing the alien concept of the union as a virtue into the discussion, but Ram is the one who's able to um, translate that message into an understanding that the largely Ferengi and Bajoran employees of the bar can understand and work with and not see as some kind of either something that's evil or something that's futile. Yeah, I think these are both really great points. Um, and, and you see that in each of the the basically union meeting scenes where he he gets them all together and and i think that's that's um 
that's particularly true the 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 listening part i i hadn't really thought through it in uh that aspect but that's one of the most important parts about um about organizing uh when you're sitting down when you're having these conversations if you are organizing you have to listen uh, because if you aren't listening and actually addressing what people need you're not going to be successful um and the cultural mediation is something that's, <laughs> I think, also very specific to Star Trek because, um, because as as you said, they are uh, they are aliens, and Rom does that. Yeah, you're right. Rom does that very well. You know, you made me think also about this moment. I think it's Brunt, who's the for, he's the inspector from the yeah. Ferengi Business Authority. He describes the when he's trying to say like, "Hey guys, just drop this union thing, and I won't report on you." He says, "Oh, you guys are tempted by Bajoran ideals," mm -hmm. which is like perfect outside agitator language that would actually be used by the bosses in a union campaign. It's like, "Oh, you guys don't really want a union. You're just being corrupted by outside agitators who are possibly, you know, Jewish and or communists." Yeah. And I'm like, "Yep." Yeah. <laughs> That's what they say. Oh, actually, I just want to say for our listeners, like I said, we've gotten a lot of questions about like, when are you guys going to talk about Judaism and DS9? Uh, we are definitely doing that. Sarah and I are both Jewish and from Jewish households, uh, but we're like planning a, a, a broader conversation with some experts who talk around around anti-Semitism. Um, and we'll be like doing that as his own sort of exploration. So don't worry, we'll be talking about all the things that are both problematic and wonderful um, in that lane, but we're, we're focusing on the labor part of it today. Um, but back to Ferengi culture. Uh, I, I love this interaction where when, when, when Bashir is trying to explain to Ram why he needs a reunion, Ram says something kind of amazing that's just like so fucking human, which is, you don't understand. Ferengi workers don't want to stop the exploitation. We want to find a way to become exploiters. And Bashir gets in the parting words saying, suit yourself, but I don't see you exploiting anyone. Asher, do you have thoughts on that conversation? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I mean, it seemed particularly like American capitalist uh, to me when I watched it. Um, I was like, yeah, this is sort of this idea that um, th this, you know, Star Trek, uh, the Ferengi put in, in particularly stark terms, but I was watching it. I was like thinking, you know, at, in America, you have this idea that um, this rugged individualism that is going to lead you to the success where you, by your own bootstraps, are going to become a millionaire or billionaire, right? You're going to be able to make it. All you have to do is work hard to do it. And the truth is, most people can't. That's just the way that the economy works. Most people won't. Um, and there's there's an idea that like settling for something else is, in fact, just settling. Recognizing that you can do well and you can be happy without becoming, you know, the one percent. Um, uh, that. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that that almost seems foreign to America and to too many Americans. And I uh, I watched it and I was like, yeah, I see that in everybody who's like, I don't need a union because I'm going to work harder and eventually I'm going to be in charge. But you see that across all like policy, right? I don't want mm -hmm. I, I don't want uh, universal health care because someday I will have this. I don't want to have paid vacation because someday I'll have to pay people for vacation. Things like that. And it's like what. No, we should all want that for everyone. And chances are you're never actually going to be the one in that position. You're never going to be the 1%. So you don't have to worry about taxing the rich because your taxes won't, <laughs> you won't, you won't be that rich person. Um, so since the, before, since the, the bar employees uh, organized to become the Guild of Restaurant and Casino Employees, which is literally the union unite here. Um, I was trying to think about which <laughs> other, right? Like they're literally in unite here. Yeah. Like at any moment in time, they're, they're, they're going to start wearing black and red and like to have a lot of thoughts about Las Vegas, but, um, and be doing, doing door knocking in Georgia right now. But, um, but so who are some other folks in the sort of DS9 universe who like you think are really like would be ready to have their own union subplot? Oh, um, well, I, I guess you have to think about who's an employee. I mean, I think you could have a situation where the Bajoran uh, workers uh, could, 
um, that their employment structure is uh, different from the Federation's, even though the Federation is there um, running the station. So you, you have that opportunity. Um, I mean, at one point, Keiko O'Brien was running a school. I have some issues with how um, the school is represented there. It's all rote memorization. But um, uh, you, have, uh, <laughs> you, have, you have that. So you, you got, um, you've got AFT on the station. Um, mm-hmm. uh, in Deep Space Nine specifically. I mean, oh, well, you've got you know, a bunch of the freighters. Uh, so what about the crew of oh, Cassidy Yates, right? Her yes, crew, her crew yes. deserves a union, especially when she's Space having to make... Space Teamsters. Yeah. Space Teamsters. <laughs> I have been arguing for the need for Space Teamsters for a long time because I'm a fan of the of Deep Purple and they have that song Space Trucking, <laughs> which means that somewhere there is Teamsters Local Infinity, which is the Space Teamsters Union. Yeah. I um, will know with yeah. the education... Um, mm-hmm. On the, on the subject of education and how education is represented, that that, again, is a whole separate future episode. That is my professional field. <laughs> so I have an hour of just everybody else mute and listen to me complain about that representation. <laughs> but again, things we're not doing right now. Yeah, literally yeah. every every episode where they're like, they show on Vulcan and they're like, you know, able to cite all these facts. I'm like, okay, so you got rote memorization down, but where is the critical thinking? I want some project-based learning in this. I want some, <laughs> where's the career and technical education? Uh, where are all of the um, apprenticeships that we're not seeing? Anyway. Um. <laughs> and then, you know, you just like make Nog a field officer without having him, you know, finish his education. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, you throw... Uh, Jake Sisko right into the the lucrative and exciting field of journalism um, <laughs> without any sort of um, apprenticeship or journalistic training, training in that yeah. field. Like, um, yeah, yeah, on the front so, lines you know, too during a war. Of, 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 of the Sarah Daniel Rasher complains about about sci fi depictions <laughs> of the Education <laughs> Hour, but yeah, there's a lot there. But, but speaking of people's career paths. Um, this is an episode that ends with, you know, the, the union is successful, although it doesn't, they're not allowed to call themselves that publicly because of the FCA. I think we uh, should, the, we should put a pin in that and talk about that at the end, but. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say, but like at the end of this episode, Rom joins the Bajoran Repair Corps mm-hmm. of the space station. And the first time I saw this episode, I didn't like that, that that was the ending of this. Like I felt like, this is a that is a good development of his character in general, but I, I wanted him to stay at Quarks to like be a union huh. leader, like in the union. I don't know if you have feelings about that way this ends. Okay, well, so so then uh, we won't put a pin in it. We'll talk about it now. Um, so first of all, <laughs> uh, as a side note, because I thought we were going to talk about Rom's character development, um, I'll say that ultimately this turned into a really great moment for um, the character for Rom uh, set the actor up for some great things and also mm-hmm. laid the groundwork for his future relationship with Lita, um, who also I have uh, met several times. Um, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful um, actress and um, activist actually. Um, but uh, what they do at the end actually has always been sort of, they, they did it for, for, I think they did it for several reasons. The, the fact that they weren't allowed to recognize the union, they had to tie it up quickly and they had to set it in universe with the Ferengi. Um, I really did appreciate that he, everybody got everything that they wanted um, because Quark is so good at his fake ledgers, but um, uh, it, it is disappointing that the union doesn't get to be recognized as for Rom staying to be the union. Actually, there is one episode later. I looked it up. Um, uh, there is an episode, uh, in season six where two Ferengi waiters are talking and Quark says, what is this, your union meeting? So they do reference it again. Um, but, uh, I, I, ultimately I think that Rom leaving, while it would have been fun to have more union, uh, subplots, Rom leaving really was a, a, a smart move for the character, because he had grown so much more. He was so much more than this specific job and he needed to be challenged. Um, so I thought that that was just in terms of storytelling, pretty good. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And this is an important, this is, this is like the pivotal episode really in Rom's character development. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I read actually online um, once that the actor was very 
nervous and unhappy that they were going to have him leave Quark's bar. But in the by the end of the series, realized that it was um, a really good move for his character because he does mm-hmm. get to grow so much more. He gets to um, ultimately be with Lita. Um, you you get to see him play a pivotal role uh, in the the rest of the station outside of the confines of the bar which becomes just so nice. And the actor was just so talented. I mean, when you think about when you, one of the things that I love about Star Trek is that some of these actors, especially specifically Deep Space Nine, these actors that they have playing some of these supporting characters acting under all of that makeup and the plastiques, that is, that is hard work. That is incredible work. And the way they have um, Rene Abogenois, who does plays Odo, uh, Armin Shimmerin, who plays Quark, uh, Max uh, Grudenchik plays Rom, um, all, all of them. Uh, Jeffrey Combs as uh, Brunt and his many, many other characters. Uh, <laughs> the every person, all of the Cardassians, the, the the performances that they're able to give under that is is just so amazing. I don't remember how we got under these. <laughs> I just started getting excited. Oh, just talking I also about like say, Rom's character, yeah. Rom's character development through this episode. I should also say that I have, I studied um, theater and, and specifically acting in college. So I get really excited when I see actors that good under that much makeup. I'm like, wow, oh, yeah. that's impressive. Well, I want you to tell, I mean, to talk a little bit about, this is a LeVar Burton directed episode. Mm-hmm. And there was a few few directorial choices in it that stood out to me but like from your perspective like what are the, some of the the directorial choices that work or don't work for you with this episode oh um directorial choices well first of all i mean i, I think it uh it's it was it's great that it's lavar burton episode um uh he's he turned into a really good director i know that he started directing uh i believe he started directing episodes during the uh the next generation i know he directed a bunch of voyager episodes um directorial choices i thought um you know i i thought that the union scenes were shot particularly well i, I mean i think just visually like what you look at you, he created a sense of solidarity with the mm. uh with the workers everything from like there's that the, the the scene when quark walks into the bar and they're all standing there he's created a a visual for you to understand their strength and when they walk out and quark realizes he's alone in the bar that was a very powerful moment that he as the director was able to create um i i also think that the uh the moment when brunt interrupts the union meeting and you have fruel um immediately get scared and they Rom is able to overcome that uh, that intimidation and um, uh, win everyone back and leave Fruel on the ground. That also, I think, was a particularly good visual representation and an emotional cue for everyone watching. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy who's there groveling on the ground, begging for forgiveness for thinking, I should be treated fairly. Yeah. Solidarity is like strength. I mean, mm-hmm. and like organizing with his coworkers, like Lita is immediately, she's always liked Rom, but like she actually respects him mm-hmm. because his, because he's doing this now in like a different way. Like, I don't think they would have become a couple if he hadn't done this. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, and actually, like, there is um, also something to the fact that Ron leaves at the end of the episode. Like, I, it makes me sad because I think of all the times there I've seen unsuccessful union organizing campaigns and some of the most active members of the organizing campaign then, like, become union staff. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it, like, and I, I, it's like, yeah, you've, like, proven that you're really good at this. So I'm glad to have you on board. <laughs> but I'm really, you know, it makes me sad, too. I don't know. It's complicated. What, what were the directing choices that stood out to you? I, I totally agree with what you said. One of the others, though, is I just think that this episode is way up in Rom and Quark's faces, mm. like, so much. Yeah. Um, and especially in the scenes between the two of them. Um, and obviously, they have the acting chops, as you say, to, like, make that work. But uh, especially when they're having their confrontations around their family dynamic and how, like, Rom feels like Quark has always been putting him down mm-hmm. um, to sort of make him feel more self feel more masculine. Like, that's just, like... It's like up their noses, and I, I like it. This particular story was initially supposed to be the B plot of another episode, but thankfully the showrunners were like, actually, no, this is amazing. This is its own episode. This is not a B plot. However, this episode does have B plots. What is your favorite thing that happens with unrelated people during this episode? I have one of mine. I want to hear yours. I don't know if this sort of meets 
what your question was because it is not B plot related, although it involves a B plot character, which mm-hmm. is Worf crosses the picket line. Yes. Which is a like it's a big no no. So for anyone listening, don't ever cross a picket line. That's a dick move. Don't do it. Like it's awful. Um, don't be that person. Worf is that person, which really is like disappointing. And then my favorite thing that happens is that Chief O'Brien picks a fist fight with a Klingon for crossing a picket line. Wow. Yeah. Chief O'Brien yeah. will forever I will love him for forever for that. If you're picking a fist fight with a Klingon about crossing a picket line, you are the hero of the episode. That's for real. Yeah. And I, I it was interesting like that scene with um Bashir and uh, O'Brien, like looking to see who goes in and who crosses mm-hmm. the picket line and who doesn't, and just sort of looking at everyone's reactions to there being a picket line. You know, when 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 they, when um, when Cisco gets involved, mm-hmm. the role he plays in it kind of reminds me of the role that uh, Democratic governors are often asked to play in yeah. union disputes. Where somebody's like, oh, my God, the fucking company is just dragging the shit out. Let me call our like our local Democratic Party governor, like our governor who's a Democrat. Yeah. And see if he can just sort of be like, listen here, we all want this to be over. Don't you want this to be over? Can you just settle? Thank you. Um, and that was so to me, that really was like, oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah. The, the way that Cisco leans on uh, leans on court. He's like, OK, so uh, you have to settle this because uh, we've never made you pay rent. So. <laughs> it's just it's so great because you're like oh okay well cisco's cisco is clear which side cisco is on and i really appreciate that and yeah it is like a democratic governor a democratic politician who's going to come in and be like very clearly on one side but also mediate i mean you see that with mayors yeah. and governors all the time yeah and it's also yeah. a nice callback to something that was really set up in the early episodes of the series and then not really revisited which is that the original reason that Quark is even running a business on the station is that Cisco went to him right away and said, you have to keep the bar open because like the existence of um, recreation, the existence of viable businesses is one of the things that's going to make it possible for us to maintain this um, station as a joint federation and Bajoran venture So, um, so putting him in that governor role is hilarious, but it's also, um, a nice bit of consistency with a premise that was set up early and had not really been explored enough. And also a nice bit of consistency in the relationship between Cisco and Quark that shows up Mm. through their sons being friends and through, um, them sort of having to, have a different kind of working relationship than really anyone else on the station. Yeah. My, my favorite sort of unrelated to the main plot moment from the episode is that Dax makes Worf a mixtape. <laughs> I mean, okay. So like fuck Worf because he crossed the picket line, but Dax making Worf a mixtape is really cute. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, this is just a few episodes before they get together. Right. Like it's clear. Yeah. She, she likes him. Yeah. Their chemistry is so good. Yeah. My goodness. Speaking of people who have chemistry with other people, uh, Lita has some really great moments in this episode, mm-hmm. you know, showing that she's really brave and caring. And I know, Asher, you have an uh, actual Chase Masterson story of note, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, uh, which which one? Uh. That's true. You have several. <laughs> um, so, I, I well, well, so, so, f- I mean, the first time I ever met her, I was just, I was a kid in um, uh, junior high. I don't know if this is the the one that you wanted. I was a kid in junior high and I was at a Star Trek convention. I grew up in Los Angeles and um, I went to the Star Trek convention in Pasadena, um, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. And um, she was speaking and somehow we missed it. I was disappointed because I really wanted to see her. I lived in Space Nine. And literally we saw her in the hallway on the way out and we're like hey um sorry i i i and like we we chatted with her for a second she was very friendly and i was like i wanted an autograph and she was like well do you have a piece of paper and i was with my mom because i was a kid and all we had was my mom's checkbook so Mm -hmm. we pulled out one of the slips from the back so you can like 
calculate things. And she signed the <laughs> thing for my mom's checkbook. I kept it in my wall Aww. for years. Um, but I think the I think the story that you are um, thinking of is when I was in college. I was in community college studying theater. Um, uh, one of my very close friends, uh, she and I were in this show together. It was like a musical review. And her sister showed up to um, record. Uh, her sister like came backstage right before. It was like, hi, I'm here to record. I was like, oh, yeah, there's a seat for you in the front row. And go And she recorded. Um, so I met her brief, this, my, my friend's sister briefly. Um, a few weeks later, uh, I was like having lunch with my friend. And something about Star Trek came up. She's like, oh, yeah, you like Star Trek, don't you? Yeah, my sister who came to see the show, she was in Star Trek. I was like, wait, who's... Who's your sister? She said, um, well, she played um, a character on, I don't, I don't remember which show. She was, was <laughs> she, she works in a bar. And I was like, wait, is your sister Chase Masterson? Did she play Lita? She was like, yeah. It's like, wait, is that the sister that I gave directions to that I, you, you didn't introduce me to your, your <laughs> sister? And uh, so she later brought her to, um, a decade later, brought her to a birthday party of mine. <laughs> Um, I love it. <laughs> so Chase Masterson came to my birthday, and we are Facebook friends now, and have chatted a few times about her anti-bullying work. She's doing some great uh, work. That's amazing. Yeah, that was that was her thing that I got to speak at at New York Comic Con back in mm. whenever year it was that we last had New York Comic Cons. Yeah, and she's so good in this episode. Um, she really like her. You you know one of the things that you think about when you when you're doing something like this is like you have. Um, uh, Rom bought it, and he's trying to convince everyone else. And the fact that she would, she publicly believed in him in these moments, which is so clear throughout, gave everybody else the opportunity to say, "Yeah, yeah, he is right." And um, her, as the like most enthusiastic supporter of his, um, really mm-hmm. is just <laughs> wonderful throughout the episode. Even from the beginning, when the at the very beginning of the episode, um, when he's not feeling well, she's advocating for him, and uh, she she gets to. This is also a point when they really start to develop her character. Yeah. And it's one of the things that's interesting about her character in terms of work is that despite kind of other characters, external attempts to kind of depict her as, you know, just this sort of like flighty Dabo girl that she's always depicted as having a lot of gravitas to her and as having chosen this work very deliberately and caring a lot about doing her job well. Um, and this mm-hmm. really builds into that very consistent, like she looks how she looks, but she, her identity as a person who does a job is mm-hmm. much more important to her. Absolutely. I, there's two moments that stood out to me in this rewatch of things that Quark tries to pull, that management always tries to pull in real life this. organizing campaigns. Um, well, why don't you answer it first? Oh, well, I just like, I actually sort of made a, a list in my head and I tried to write it down of the different tactics that you always see management do. And mm-hmm. I mean, I just mentioned one of them at the very beginning. Um, uh, Lita says something and Quirk immediately threatens to fire her. He's like, you're going to have a lot of, uh, uh, free time if you don't get back to the Davo table right now. And like, that is a, a fairly, um, common tactic, um, then um, one of the moments uh, where Quark shows up and tries to buy him off. Yep. Quark shows up and offers him a bunch of slips then strips of latinum. And like that is another one. Um, and you actually see this throughout um, various types of uh, uh, movies and, and plays and TV shows about labor organizing where uh, management will can will sometimes come in, especially <laughs> back in the day they'd try to come in and buy off the leaders if we can give you this much uh can we settle the whole thing um and then the other one of the other big ones of course is the uh the the when the pinkertons show up when the violence uh happens to send a message and to quash the uh the union did you have some others that you noticed Mm mm-hmm Quark attempts to ha- t- attempts at automation and it fails. Oh yes, yes, the automation <laughs> automation is obscene. Oh my god, it's so great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he replaces the workers with uh, holograms. Oh, I just died. It was, I laughed yeah. so hard. 
Yeah. And there's a whole like thread in Deep Space Nine of failed attempts at automation Mm -hmm. um, from the one that um, Alana and I had been talking about where like they trigger an old Cardassian and Anti insurgency program, and it's it just is such a good episode. Station. Attention, visual like and the workers. Best episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to like turning Bashir into the uh, the emergency medical hologram. Like, there's just a long history of like anything that you attempt to automate goes horribly wrong. Um, and that, that's it's, and this is one of, like just like a quick joke kind of version of that. Yeah. But it's so accurate. They're always like, well, we don't need you anyway. We're just going to make you guys, we're going to like replace the bank tellers with mach- with ATM machines instead. And you're like, uh, not all of them. No. Uh, did you also laugh when the police officer showed up and was like, I don't actually like the strike? Yeah. Talk to me about your thoughts about Odo's <laughs> response and all of this. Well, I mean, Odo, Odo represents law and order and like uh, uh, power that, that just wants everything to be normal and smooth and nobody to rock the boat, right? So, of course, he doesn't like the strike, right? Of course, um, the idea that there would be uh, a group of people speaking out, creating commotion on the promenade, of course, Odo's not going to like it. Um, and I, I do think it, it plays into a pretty funny, um, especially with the, the conversations that people are having currently about the police, uh, it sort of <laughs> plays into a, a funny dynamic um, where the officer and the person who represents um, uh, law and order on the show uh, is like, yeah, I, I don't like this union business. If you have to, um, what does he say? If you, if you have to uh, form a mob to get what you want, it's not worth getting. Um, Ridiculous. Which I, I think everybody is, uh, probably anybody listening to this podcast uh, would uh, not necessarily agree with that. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that I was like, oh, yeah, that's right out of the usual union busting playbook was when, there, when um, Quark pulls Ram aside and is like, look, you're my brother. We're family. Why are you treating me like this? And Ram is like, actually, no, in this particular context, we are not family. We are employer and employee. And this is very literal in the case of this story, but in real life, a lot of companies are like, oh, you shouldn't organize. I think of ourselves, we really think of each, we're all family here. We're all family in this company. And that's why you don't need a union getting between you and us. And it's like, no, you're not family. You're our employer. That's the reality of this relationship. And so in the, in, in the show, it's so much, it's interesting because it's like, well, they actually are related, but Ram is right at the heart of it in that in this context, he is not your brother. He's your employee. And that is how he's being treated. And that's why he needs a union. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the thing that I was going to say is really a similar point that one of the things that comes up over and over in this episode is the blurring of these professional relationships with with personal relationships. Because the mm-hmm. other side of the Quark and Odo dynamic is that for Odo, Quark is a known quantity and Quark is something that he as a police officer can control and we frequently see those relationships where um where where sort of government authorities like the Bajoran police force um want to keep whatever boss is currently in control in control because that relationship already exists and so occasionally it's a corrupt relationship but often even when it's not there is that sense of like, we know what our role as police is in your business and vice versa. Whereas if the union takes over, it's something that Odo can't control. And then on top of that, there is a an emotional bond between Odo and Quark. And on some level, as much as Odo rolls his eyes at Quark, he's also very... You know, he cares a lot about Quark and he doesn't want to see Quark fail. And he's, you know, as much as he's always going to cover that up, that's going to be part of it, too. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's actually, yeah, that's really, I mean, you could probably do an entire episode about the relationship between. Their relationship. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and um, we will. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it really, it really is such a wonderfully complex thing to watch. Um throughout the series. But I think that is, that is very true within the context of this episode. Like, even though he, he is um, a nuisance, he is the known quantity and he is someone that he wants to see succeed. Uh, 
Um, I have a sort of a Ferengi cultural question, which is that it's established in this episode that the workers all have contracts with their employer and that Ferengi work contracts are a thing that exists. It's just that they only work in one direction. It's only about like, it's the comp, you know, the employer has all the power over you. Um, and so it's not even like they're working at will labor. It's working, they're working on contracted labor, but the contract is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, and, and then when the workers, when Ram first says, we're going to form a union, the workers know what a union is. I think that's all really interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, part of that is because you have to move the story along in 42 minutes. But um, uh, I mean, I, I, I think the concept, you know, th- they say that it's explicitly illegal within their culture. Um, so that either would suggest that in the past, some Ferengis were like, hey, we don't like being exploited. Um, uh, and I mean, maybe they were women when with clothes and pockets. Oh. But, um, but uh, then you have also, um, uh, I, I, I think it, I think you hit on a point there where like the, the contracts specifically explicitly um, are meant simply to help the employer uh, exploit, to use their own words, to exploit the employee, to ensure that the maximum amount amount of profits are um, gained. So, I mean, I think this is through theoretically through um, thousands and thousands of years of experience trying to figure out how to create a system that best helps the employer, a system that best, that creates the most profit for the company, for the company owner. And I think it shows that like contracts are powerful. If contracts weren't powerful, the Ferengi employers wouldn't be going around making people sign them. So of course workers deserve a contract too. And contracts are, remember the thing that gets, um, Quark booted from Ferengi culture for a brief period of time is that he breaks a contract when he's essentially forced into a contract that he can't um, fulfill. Uh, So Hmm. um, the Ferengi worship the idea of the contract as almost a sacred object of their culture. But, um, and it makes sense uh, if you look at it that way, that like they see a, a union type contract as being a profanation of what they see as um, an ideal or virtuous contract. That is such a good point. <laughs> um, and I actually hadn't sort of brought it around to that, that spot until now, but that's a really great point. And you do see that the, fir- that like, I mean, it, it makes sense in a, a, a society like theirs that is driven by like hyper capitalism that honoring those contracts and expecting enforcement of those contracts is how they function. Yeah. Do you, do you have any sort of broader thoughts about like the labor practices of Starfleet? Ooh, well, I mean, we haven't gotten within Star Trek. We don't get to many uh, lower decks characters. So, so this sort of, uh, you know, you sort of guessing based on, on different things. First of all, um, you have the, the next generation episode, lower decks. You now have this TV series, lower decks, which I, um, okay. So I said at the beginning, I've seen every minute of star Trek ever created. I think I'm like five episodes behind on lower decks. So I guess that was a lie. I will catch up soon um (laughs) and uh it's fine i haven't finished it either okay okay i I realize like as i I realize now that i'm admitting to being incorrect about star trek which is like oh right in the heart um i i have not seen uh i have not seen five episodes um anyway i uh so the the broader labor practices i mean sort of Starfleet sits sort of as this almost military but science-based organization. So, like, there's the implication that, like, being a part of it is is more like a, 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 a military service. And, 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 and I, I don't want it to – like, it's not supposed to be, you know, about conquering. It's supposed to be about 
peace and science and exploration. But the, the structure seems to be more structured on that. Um, sure. You, you have the basically like the lower decks people, the lower ranked people who, um, who go around uh, and, and seem to have the, um, the not great jobs, the, the uh, shifts that nobody should want uh, the, and lower decks, you see the dirty jobs like cleaning out the uh, the filters on the um, the holodecks, which lets us know that yes, that's what the holodecks are used for, um, <laughs> not just at Quark's yeah. bar, but on the on the the starships. Um, so, I mean, you you do have some uh, some questions about that. I mean, you 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 don't seem to have any indication that there are that there's labor unrest. There seems to be you know uh, unhappiness. Oh, I wish I was rising through the ranks faster, but you don't seem to have any. Um, within Starfleet, you don't seem to have any depictions of uh, unrest. Um, I mean, in Voyager, you have like some Maquis issues, and yeah, um, uh, I'm, try- I'm trying to think of, of uh, some other ones. But I mean, throughout throughout the uh, one of one of the interesting things that I think, uh, and what I like about Star, part of what I like about Star Trek is this examination of what happens when like this utopian. Uh, society meets a culture that doesn't specifically uh, adhere to the same rules in this case in deep space nine that's actually what they examine all the time um yeah and in in the case of the ferengi you have uh, capitalism specifically intersecting with um while they were not explicit about it until discovery you have a, like some sort of utopian post-scarcity socialist future um if not outright communist. Um, so you, uh, watching, watching sort of those interactions, they have it throughout enterprise, which is not the best of the star Trek series. Um, (laughs) (laughs) being kind, uh, you have it in like the episode workforce, you have it in episodes where they go back in time and, and they have to deal with money for the first time. Um, things like that. Um, but I, I just like, I, you know, the thing is, like, you're not a, like legally, it is illegal to have a labor union in a military body. Like, that's just true. But Star Trek, but the Starfleet is one of the major employers, it seems, maybe I'm wrong, like, in the world of its time for humans, like, from Earth at least. And, like, all workers need a union. And, like, even if they don't, even if people don't need money to eat, you know, they still have bosses. Yeah, well, you know, Star Trek hasn't, as far as I can tell, Star Trek hasn't actually examined that. There's this sort of this idea that, like, joining Starfleet is is theoretically voluntary, right? It's just something you aspire to. Um, and so um, I, that that's not to say that you won't have a bad boss, uh, a, a captain or some sort of commander or man- management on your ship that is going to oh, yeah. punish you because they don't like you or... Um, you know, in theory, they've moved beyond racism, but you do see some racism against different species um, in Star Trek. Uh, I mean, theoretically, yeah, you should be able to. You would want them to be able to. Um, I, 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 I think that we, we like to believe that somehow they've gotten beyond that in the future or that Starfleet has some magical way of, um, of settling any sort of dispute like that. But the truth is, like, workers deserve to have the right to organize and to bargain collectively for fair wages and uh, working conditions. In this case, working yeah, conditions because there are no wages. Exactly. Yeah, totally. And we do occasionally see in Star Trek examples of employees going to employers and changing their conditions. And the one that stands out to me the most is Next Generation. So, Alana, briefly close your ears. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But um, <laughs> I don't care about spoilers. But um, there's the subplot in Chain of Command and Next Generation where um, Captain Jellico makes Troy wear her uniform and she realizes that she should have been advocating for wearing her uniform in a professional context all along. And that leads to her actually testing for promotion and really advocating for herself and her own position within the labor chain as a result of um, sort of having a different boss that opened up different possibilities to her. 
So I think that as much as some of the Starfleet labor practices are iffy to me, there is there are indications that there is a um a self advocacy structure within that that's accepted. Absolutely, and that's I mean good. You, you do see individuals um, throughout the series, throughout the various series come forward and say, this is an assignment I'm really interested in. This is a project I would like to do. Um, so you you do theoretically have a culture and uh, some sort of framework where people are free to say that, to say, I, I think I belong on this mission. I think I belong. I think this is a project that I would like to work on. I want to study this type of thing. And I think we need to, to uh, direct resources to it. And and you generally see the uh, whoever the commanding officer is agreeing. Um, Asher, you were talking about the episode Past Tense, which depicts really what is coming very close to being our current present um, <laughs> as a sort of failed late, late stage capitalism and especially a failure of labor policy. And my question is, what do you think about that depiction? What, like, what is it warning against? How is it feeding into overall conceptions of um, labor and social justice in the series? Like, how does it fit into the general message if it does? Oh, well, I mean, well, so in, in the episode, they, they jumped to the past, which at that point was the near future. So fortunately we have um, gotten past that, the, the, the bell riots and and that, but I, I think their depiction <laughs> of um, of inequality in that episode of creating like a, a camp for people who don't have jobs and confining them there while uh, the rest um, are free to go about as long as they have ID in some sort of authoritarian state um, is something that like should make everyone nervous and the way that they were able to really. Um, uh, pretty candidly address inequality in that episode, I think was, was great. I think one of the things I remember reading at one point a couple of years ago is roughly around the time, the like within a couple of weeks of when the episode premiered, the mayor of Los Angeles was trying to figure out what to do with um, Skid Row in downtown and proposed like creating a camp. And everybody was like, huh, that's funny. Cause there's literally an episode of Star Trek about that, that just premiered. Um, but, uh, you know, the, it, it is a warning about how we um, treat joblessness, about how we um, deal with inequality, um, and about, it's particularly, I think, resonant right now, as you were saying, Sarah Daniel, that um, uh, in, in, in this moment of heightened inequality, where like in the middle of a, a pandemic, where we've faced a recession, so millions of people have lost their jobs, but the billionaires have increased their wealth. Um, we have to create situations where our um, our response isn't to push people aside and pretend it doesn't happen, pretend that uh, everything is okay uh, behind those walls where we're keeping the, the poor. We have to make sure that our policies are about actually helping uh the most people, the, 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 the meeting the needs of the many, not the needs of the few or the one. And I think one of the things that past tense does really well is that it shows that many of the people who are employed are perceiving that as a very tenuous situation and they're doing things that they don't necessarily want to do because they're afraid of losing their job and because they know that if they lose that job, they're very close to being in the same situation as the the residents of the camp um, yeah like dick miller even god i love dick miller so much <laughs> um, I, I just saw him in after hours last night the, uh, such a good movie wait, wait um, that, the old that old movie that takes place in one night yeah oh my god i love that movie as a kid i haven't seen it in so long you watched After Hours by Martin Scorsese as a child. Oh, I yeah. I had it on VHS and I watched it over and over. I loved it. 
Oh, Terry Gar, and when she puts up that wanted poster, it's so good. And then he like shows up at the diner again. And the guy has the the food yeah. ready for. Oh, it's so good. I love that movie. I feel Although like you I, know a lot about a person by the movies that like they should have not seen as young as they saw them. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I so Asher apparently saw After Hours as a child. I saw Easy Rider. Sarah, what did you watch at a disturbingly young age? I'm well, my like. Thank you for get, for segueing right into my self plug because my current writing project is because the pandemic has made me lose what's left of my marbles. Um, I made a list of all of my favorite movies, all 124 of them, and I'm now watching them in alphabetical order and writing about them. And the number of movies that I'm realizing that I saw when I was way too young is like so long that it's a little <laughs> disturbing. And um and I feel like I'm going to get to all of them in this writing project, but um, like, but but yeah, it's I I don't even know, and I also don't want to spoil for things I haven't written yet. But yeah, when, I understand. When I when I was a kid, I had two favorite musicals. Spoilers: I'm gay um, and loved musicals as a kid. Um, so uh, Les Mis, which like the economics of that, obviously another indicator. Um, of where my life is going. But then my other favorite musical, which I loved in elementary school and junior high school, and I'd walk around singing it, is a musical called Falsettos. Yes. And if you don't know Falsettos, it's a musical about gay Jews dying of AIDS. And <laughs> as an elementary yep. schooler, yep. I'd walk around singing, you gotta die sometime. Um, and I just loved, uh, I love that music. Yeah, I saw, I saw that a, a live performance of that with my mother when I was about 12. So it's you and me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, you that's true. You guys are both big nerds about that. Yes, um, my mother well, my mother who has been mentioned who is very disappointed that the podcast I'm on is not about musical theater. So uh, the next one. Oh god. Well, you know, if I was on a podcast about musical theater, I'd be like, here's the like Ilana's favorite musicals that are all from the 70s and <laughs> now that's all. <laughs> Moving along. Are there, were there musicals before or after this? Who can say? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I want to thank you, Asher, for joining us. Um, if there's anything we haven't hit on that you wish we had, like, hit us up. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's I, – like, I made a few notes. I mean, there's some implications. There's about to be a very big spoiler if I say this. Um, there are some spoiler pretty big – Spoiler for what? For, for Deep Space Nine. Uh, there's oh, some, please, spoil, spoil th it. There's some pretty it. big implications in the future of Ferengi culture, knowing that Rom is a successful labor organizer and, you know, what happens to Rom at the end of the series. Right. He becomes a Grand Nagus. Huh. So what does it mean? He's are his, Will his reforms include labor reforms? Probably. Definitely women's rights stuff. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is a form of labor reform. <laughs> it's women's rights are labor rights. That's so That's so interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought about the fact that because he becomes Grand Nagus and he's a former union organizer, like what could be a bigger change in Ferenginar than that? Yeah. That's amazing. So I think that's all in terms of the episode that I had thought to jot down. We talked talk about everything else. How great Lita is. Uh, don't be so cruel. Great. Don't be wharf. Yeah. Yeah. That is real. Well, thank you again. Tell our listeners where's the best place for them to keep abreast of your excellent stuffs that you do and are up to. Oh, gosh. I don't know. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Asher Huey. It's just my name. Very simple. A S H E R H U E Y. Yep. And, and, um, I know I've only known you for a million years. I'm just like not good at spelling. Um, <laughs> And as for us, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter a little bit too much, E-L-A-N-A -A underscore Brooklyn. Feel free to shoot us questions for the show for future episodes. We have a lot of stuff coming up we're working on, including things like O'Brien, the, o the o Keiko and Miles O'Brien couples therapy needs, uh, feminism from the 90s specifically within the show um, are two of the uh, episodes coming up in quite short order. Um and Sarah, where can folks find your work on the internet? Yeah, I am on Twitter at Podashop, P-A-S underscore D-E-C-H-A-T. My website is thefinersports.com. 
it is no longer purely a figure skating blog. And as plugged earlier, I am right now writing about all these movies I'm watching because we're in a sports season where nobody should be doing indoor climate controlled sports. Um, here, here. Uh, yeah. So and I recently got a letterboxed account that is also Padesha. Oh, cool. Um. And obviously, you know, this this podcast is, continues to be supported by Graphic Policy, which is your comics website for comic, all things comics and geek related, uh, and particularly with a political and socially engaged lens. Um, if this podcast isn't showing up on your favorite pod capture platform, let us know. We're still figuring out how we want to sort of serve this along with regular um, Graphic Policy Radio. Uh, but remember, as Odo says, um, if there is a picket line on the promenade, Respect it. Don't cross it. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at Graphic Policy. Dot com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.